Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. I know we'll be a smaller crew here this morning because people are traveling for the holidays and things like that, but people are still trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm so glad that you have joined us, whether you're here in the room or you're with us online. Glad that you're here. We are still celebrating the birth of Jesus, uh, the gift of God's Son, the Word made flesh this morning. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and join me in a responsive reading that is our call to worship. In this call to worship, we will join the words of Mary as she celebrates what the angel told her about the birth of her son Jesus. So join me in this call to worship. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Our King and Savior now draws near. Oh, come, let us adore him. Let's pray. Father, help us to join those words this morning, not only with what we say and with what we sing, but with our whole hearts, our complete selves. Would you enable us to magnify you, to rejoice in you, because of the glorious work that you have done, the glorious gift that you have given to us in your son Jesus. Lift up our eyes and our hearts to see the beauty of who you are and what you have accomplished. And fill our hearts with joy. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. good news of the gift of Jesus to us is that we can come to him and bow before him not only with our worship, not only with our adoration, but with our confession, the confession of our sins and our failures, the ways that we have turned away from his ways, that we have gone our own way, and we can know that because he was not only born, because he not only lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, 
but because he gave himself on the cross and because he rose from the dead, conquering the power of sin, as we pray and confess our sins, we can know that we will be forgiven and that we will be shown God's mercy. And so would you join me now as we trust in him and let's pray and confess our sins together. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ, you came among us as light shining in darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to your glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. Forgive our doubt and renew our hope so that we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ the Lord. Amen. Let's spend a few moments in silence as we continue to pray and specifically, personally confess our sins to God who will forgive us. Let's pray. And now lift up your heads and hear the good news that the angels announced. This is from Luke 2. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Would you please stand and let's sing and join the celebration of the angels. of what 
Christ has done for us, we can come to him not only with our adoration, not only with the confession of our sins, but with our needs. We can come to him as his people in prayer, lifting up our needs and the needs of our world, knowing that he, even now, as the Prince of Peace, is at the throne of God, interceding for us. And so now let's join in his intercession and pray together this morning. To us a child is born. To us a son is given. And so, Father, we come as your people in prayer for those whom he came to save. Wonderful counselor, you order all things with your wisdom. Would you help your church here in Columbus and around the world to reveal the mystery of your love? Would you fill her with the spirit of truth? Mighty God, the government is on your shoulders. We ask that you would guide the leaders of the nations. We ask that you would bring in your kingdom of justice and righteousness into a world that is full of so much unrighteousness and injustice and wickedness. Everlasting Father, you call us to live together in your love as your church, within our families, within our other relationships. We ask that you would bring your mercy, bring your reconciliation. Remind us that we are your children and bless our families. Renew our neighborhoods with your care. Prince of Peace, you bring healing and reconciliation through the cross. By your healing power, we ask that you would give to all who suffer your gift of wholeness and peace. And Father, as you have made us glad, as we have remembered the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, we ask that that you would help us joyfully receive him not only today, but every day as our Redeemer, so that we may with sure confidence behold him when he returns as our judge, the one who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I don't have many announcements for you this morning. Things tend to slow down as we come uh, to the end of the year and the uh, beginning of a new one. But just one reminder that this coming Friday, there will be a game night uh, in celebration of the new year. Uh, there uh, will be a gathering here at the church. You can bring appetizers and desserts or a game to share, uh, just a time to have uh, some fun together. If you have questions about that, you can contact Camille Wilson and love to gather with you and, uh, and celebrate uh, together. So that's the only announcement I have for you this morning. Um, but I am going to change our order around a little bit. Normally at this po point in the service, I would do the sermon in the box. Uh, but I'm going to do the sermon in the box in just a minute. And first, I'm going to read our sermon text, and then pray, and then do the sermon in a box as a part of the sermon. All right? Is that okay with everyone this morning? So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you have them, or if you have access to a copy of the scriptures. I'm going to ask you to join me in Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27, we're going to come once again uh, to the prophet Isaiah, as we have uh, throughout this Advent and Christmas season. And he, by his poetry, his inspired poetry, has been teaching us what we should desire, what we should long for. He's pointed us in our desires to the gift of our Savior, Jesus. And so we're going to come once again to his words in Isaiah 27. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 6 for us. Isaiah 27 Verses 1 to 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. In that day, 
The Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisting serpent. And he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it day and night. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. I would burn them up together. Or let them lay a hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Let's pray. Father, would you help us now as we come to your word? We are grateful for this gift, but it is often a strange one, and we have another strange passage in front of us this morning, and so we ask that you would help us, you would give us clarity, that by your spirit you would open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts to not only understand your word, but to receive and to know your voice speaking to us even now, comforting us, challenging us, calling us into your glorious kingdom. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, it is time for the sermon in a box, and so I'm going to ask you to come and join me up front. Some of you are visitors with us, and so you might not know what I'm talking about when I say the sermon in a box. Our tradition here at Walnut Creek is to every Sunday have a child from the congregation put something in a box and bring it. And then I open the box, not knowing what's in the box, and try to find a spiritual lesson from what's in the box. But this morning, we're doing it a little bit differently, is I put something in the box this morning that I am going to share. Hopefully, I won't stump myself with what's in the box, and then we'll go from there, okay? So we're going to see what is in the box this morning and what we can learn from it. We have another stuffed animal. We've had a lot of those this fall. We've had a lot of stuffed animals. This isn't precisely a stuffed animal. What we have this morning is a dragon. We have a stuffed dragon in, that's right, roar, a stuffed dragon in the box this morning. And usually I ask when I open the box something like, hmm, do we find spiders in the Bible? Are there any turtles in the Bible? So I'm going to ask this morning, are there any dragons in the Bible? And there are. There are dragons in the Bible. Maybe you heard it in what we just read from the book of Isaiah. And there are not only dragons in the Bible, but there's a dragon that's a part of Christmas. I bet some of you have a nativity scene at your house, like the one right back here on the piano, and it has the baby Jesus in a manger, and Joseph and Mary, and shepherds in wise men. Well, you know what I'm going to say this morning? Is we should add a dragon to our nativity scene. And that's what the sermon is going to be about. And so I'm going to give the box to someone. I'm going to go put the dragon in the nativity scene, and then we're going to talk about why it should be there this morning, okay? That's what the sermon is going to be about, and so I'm going to send the box home with Junia. Junia, you bring it back for us next Sunday. You can return to your parents, and let's talk about dragons this morning, why they should be a part of our nativity scenes, what do dragons have to do with Christmas And what do they have to do with our lives? Well, the dragon in Isaiah 27 is called a twisting serpent, which connects this figure, this image from Isaiah 27, all the way back to the beginning. 
It connects this figure to Genesis chapter 3, where the serpent twisted God's words and enticed Adam and Eve to reach beyond the limitations that God had placed on them. And as a result of them reaching beyond the limitations that God has placed on them, they lost access to the tree of life, to the Garden of Eden. They were sent out of the garden, and they opened creation, and they opened humanity to decay and death in all its forms. And so the connection between this dragon and Genesis 3 mean that it becomes an image. The dragon becomes an image, a figure, a representation, not only of malevolent and evil spiritual forces and beings like Satan, but the dragon becomes a representation of human evil on a large scale. It represents malevolent chaos that we bring into the world when we rebel against our creator. It represents sin gone systemic in human culture and human societies. The dragon represents all that is most deeply and darkly wrong with the world. So for example, Psalm 74, describes the ancient Egyptian empire which oppressed and enslaved God's people as a sea dragon. A dragon in the sea whom God defeats by splitting the Red Sea and then consuming the Egyptian army with that water. And so all of that history and all of that symbolism leads us to Isaiah 27 where Isaiah points us towards all that is deeply and darkly wrong with the world, but not just in an abstract way in the context of this book. He is referencing not only the power and chaos of human sin, the power and chaos of evil spiritual powers, he is also speaking of that become specific in the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire, like the Egyptian Empire, which destroyed Jerusalem and exiled God's people from the land just as Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden. But as Isaiah talks about this dragon, he doesn't leave us in despair. He doesn't say that the world is hopelessly under the power of sin and evil and darkness. No, he gives us hope. He says God will come like an Arthurian knight with his hard, great, and strong sword, and he will slay the dragon. God himself will defeat what is most deeply and darkly wrong with this with this world god himself will defeat the chaotic evil that we have brought into his creation as the result of our rebellion against him now maybe that's all a little interesting to you and maybe not but still the question is what does this have to do with christmas And what does this have to do with our lives? Well, there is a missing piece from the Christmas story that we tell. Just as there is a missing piece from our nativity sets. We tell the Christmas story with Matthew 1 and Luke 2, and maybe even John chapter 1, where we hear that the word became flesh. But there is another telling of Christ's birth, and it's in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, where John, the one who told us that the word became flesh, tells us about the birth of Jesus, but he sees the birth of Jesus as a symbolic drama. And so he sees a woman having a child, 
But this woman is clothed with the sun. She is standing with the moon at her feet, and she is crowned with 12 stars. So this woman symbolizes not only Mary, but Mary as a representative of the community of God's people. The people, past, present, and future, to whom God has promised and given the Messiah, the King. And the point of that image is for us to see at that manger scene, at that nativity scene, there aren't shepherds and there aren't wise men. There aren't cows and sheep and donkeys. But at that nativity scene, there is a great red dragon. John saying to us that Christ was born into this war that stretches all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. That Christ was born into God's war against the power of sin and Satan. That Christ was born as God's definitive invasion to take back his creation from the powers of chaotic evil, the power of sin gone systemic, the power of Satan and death and decay. Remember, that when Jesus was born, we often leave out the dark part of the story. The story of Herod, the puppet king of another empire, the Roman Empire, who when he hears about this birth of his potential rival, he goes on a murderous rampage of baby boys. The dragon, once again, bringing the evil of rebellion against God and his kingdom. But John shows us in his nativity scene with this great red dragon the same hope that Isaiah gave to us. The dragon is unable to destroy the child. The child is caught up into heaven, representing Christ's victory through his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And when he is unable to destroy the child, the dragon then turns his attention to the woman. This community that belongs to the Messiah, the church, those who believe and belong to Jesus, And the dragon pursues them as his attack on God and his kingdom, but he is once again unsuccessful. And John says that the church that we conquer, defeat, slay the dragon through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Lives that believe and bear witness to the truth of the gospel. The message of what Jesus has done to defeat the power of sin. Which means that Christmas is the celebration of the birth of the dragon slayer. But not only is it the celebration of the birth of the dragon slayer, but Christmas, if you will by faith embrace its message, makes you a dragon slayer as well. My family has been watching the Hawkeye series on Disney Plus throughout this Christmas break. And I'm not going to spoil it for you. What I'm going to say is not 
I think, a spoiler of the story. But I love in the story is that the, the, they make the LARPing community a part of the story of Hawkeye in that series. Now, if you don't know what LARPing is, it stands for live action role playing. It's people who their hobbies are to dress up and to act out medieval fantasy superhero type stories. And so this television show takes LARPers, pretenders, and makes them a part of the real thing. Takes people who pretend to be superheroes and makes them a part of a superhero story. And that's what Christmas does. That's what Jesus does with your life. I'm convinced that we are born with the intuition that we should belong to a meaningful story. that our lives should matter, should in some ways be epic. And Jesus, through his birth, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection and ascension, through the gift of his Holy Spirit, he takes pretenders and he makes them a part of the real thing. He takes your life, even the ordinary, unexciting parts of your life, and he makes it a part of his epic of redemption and renewal. He takes your words, your actions, your relationships, and he makes them the strong sword of God, striking down the dragon, the power of sin, Satan, and death. And so when you, trusting in the grace of God shown to you in Jesus, when you resist the anger and the bitterness and the envy and the lust and the greed that assaults your mind and your heart, you are God's sword taking a swing at the dragon. When you ask for, give, and receive forgiveness from God and from one another, you are God's sword taking a swing at the dragon. When you set aside your preferences or your convenience in order to serve a family member or a friend or a neighbor or a fellow church member, you are God's sword, taking a swing at the dragon. When we read the scriptures, when we pray your kingdom come, when we gather here to sing and to eat bread and to drink the cup, we are God's sword. Removing the serpent, defeating the serpent. And did you notice in Isaiah when the serpent is removed, What happens? A garden, a vineyard, Eden re-emerges in the lives of God's people. That's what Jesus is doing in and through your life if you follow him by faith. He is removing the serpent and renewing the garden. So maybe you'll add a dragon to your your nativity set. 
and maybe you won't. Whatever, it's okay. But I do hope that today and tomorrow and beyond, you will celebrate, but not only celebrate, but you will participate in the king and the kingdom that you will join Jesus as he is defeating the serpent and renewing the garden and making his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the great victory that our Savior has won. By turning away from you, we have opened your creation to all sorts of destructive forces. We have become enslaved to the power of sin and death. But we are so grateful that you did not abandon us to that slavery. You did not abandon us to that darkness. You did not abandon us to the power of evil and death. But you have come to rescue us. You have brought your strong sword through your son Jesus, and not only that, but you have made us a part of the story. Would you help our lives to bear witness to that? Would you fill us with courage to resist sin this week? Would you fill us with courage to speak the beautiful truth of the gospel to our family members and our friends and our neighbors? Would you fill us with courage to serve as we have been served and to push against the darkness and to fight against the one who is your enemy. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Let's respond to the truth of Scripture by proclaiming our trust in what God has done. In this, we take a swing at the dragon as we profess the faith that has been delivered to us through the scriptures and the witness of the church. Let's affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And what we have said, let's now sing and realize that God sends us from this celebration to bring this celebration, the joy of his son's coming to our world that hear, needs to hear uh, the good news. So let's sing together. Shepherds, cavalier, why? 
Come now to the table that Jesus has given to us. And at this meal, we taste his victory over the serpent. We taste the power of the blood of the lamb that has conquered our ancient enemy and that nourishes us for the battle that we will face as we walk out of the doors this morning. And so maybe you're discouraged in the fight, in the struggle this morning. I invite you to bring your discouragement, your need for strength, your need for victory as you come and eat and drink this morning. This is a table for all of those who have been baptized into Christ's church and those who have publicly professed their faith in him. And so if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and not a part of Walnut Creek, you are welcome with us at this table. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, uh, we're going to ask you not to take this meal with us. We want to emphasize that, you are that we are glad that you are here, uh, but in order to uphold the truth, the integrity of what we're doing, we'll ask that you not eat and drink with us, but we do pray that you would see the beauty and the power of Christ, and that you would come to place your faith in him. I'm going to read some words from scripture that are called the words of institution, and I'll need some help serving uh, this meal. We're a little low on elders this morning, so I think some of our deacons are going to need to jump in and help us serve uh, the meal. Brad, can someone handle the slides while you come and help? Great. All right. We're a little low this morning. That's okay. All right. Here are the words of institution. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Help us now, Father, not only to proclaim the death of Christ, but to receive all that he has done for us. Would you help us to receive and trust in the victory that he has won for us. And then would you nourish us as we implement that victory this week, which can seem like such a long and difficult struggle. We need your encouragement for the fight. And so would you assure us that Christ is with us, that the power and presence of your spirit is with us even now as we eat and drink. We pray it all in Jesus' name. 
amen. You can take this meal in two ways. You're welcome to come up the center, uh, take a piece of bread, and dip it in the cup, and then you can return uh, by the side aisles. Or if you are taking precautions for COVID, uh, there are some packets at the ends of the rows, and you can receive uh, the meal that way as well. And you're welcome to choose either way uh, that's best for you. Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. So now let's come and enjoy the feast. Christian fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading, ill spear shall pierce him through, the cross be Well, thanks so much for being here this morning. I hope that your celebration of Christmas continues to be a time of joy and hope in Jesus and in what he has done uh, for you. We won't have classes today or next week. We're taking a break uh, for the holidays, and then we'll restart on uh, Sunday uh, the 9th. Um, but I'm glad that you have been here this morning. And just, just so you know, um, I, I am go and my family are going to leave quickly. Um, and that is not us being rude or, um, or trying to avoid uh, time with you, our church family, uh, but we have a long drive ahead of us. We're headed down to see my parents in Florida, and so we need to get on the road, all right? So we're gonna jet out uh, this morning, but uh, we do wish you all a very Merry Christmas, and uh, thanks again for being here. And now receive the benediction. And now may the God of peace 
who will soon crush Satan under your feet, fill you with all joy in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go in the peace of the dragon slayer. Amen. Thank you.